like to cordially welcome you to today's expert uh, meeting initiative for a European Association statute of association law new opportunities for civil society my name is Christina Putz I am a EU desk officer at the Heinrich Böll Foundation and I'm quite happy that one of our first expert panels that uh, we can conduct on the site here at the Heinrich Böll Foundation and but I would also like to welcome all those of you who join us via Zoom. It's uh, great. So this allows us to have some guests from Brussels here and also great speakers who join us from Paris and Budapest. The discussion will take place in German and English and will be interpreted. I hope that every one of you knows how to switch to the respective language channel that you would like to hear. Before we start, I would like to thank our uh, organization office, the technical support team here, and also the interpreters, and also my colleague Georg Mekatschen, who has well prepared this event. So what will we talk about today? Today it is about the Parliamentarian Initiative for European Association Law. And this initiative was launched by the European Parliament and in February a report was passed with a large majority and the rapporteur who has initiated all of this uh, sits to my right, Sergei Lagodinsky, and the Commission was called upon to start an, or draft an initiative and they have accepted it and said that they would do it and they will also conduct a public consultation, which uh, already started up until October. And so it's a good point of time in order to find out what's the current state of affairs, what is it about, and how can we ensure that it succeeds, and how well can it be incorporated into the German debate? I mean, we tend to talk about the non-profit aspects very intensively and how can we bring the, those two topics together that are basically interconnected. So why is it so important? This uh, European Association Law will be explained by Sergei later on. I just want to point out that um, we have different European legal statutes for different organizations for stock corporations, for example, for European cooperatives and also for European interest groups. But when it comes to associations, we do not have such a thing. So there is a need for some regulation and we would like to make a contribution that this initiative is successful this time. There have been several attempts in the past and so we now provide you with a space for an exchange. I'm also quite happy that some organizations are represented here that will be able to take the floor later on. Uh, and now I would like to welcome our speakers. Next to me is Sergei Lagodinsky and Anska Klein from the Federal Network for Civic Engagement and via Zoom, Alexandrina Nayamovic uh, has joined us. She is the Secretary General of the European Civic Forum and also Marta Padavi from the Hungarian Helsinki Committee. So welcome to all of you. Well, we will start with Sergei. Sergei when he were elected to the European Parliament as an MEP in 19, uh, 2019, you already had this idea and you were quite successful in submitting it to the European Parliament. So what was your objective initially and what's the current state? So, and what's important now? Well, this means 10 minutes and the clock is ticking. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christina. Thank you to the team of the Hanif Böll Foundation who have uh, accompanied this project for quite some time. Um, why do I mention it? Because this is also part of the answer. I mean, 
what was so important for me to launch this project. I mean, many of you who are sitting here uh, know me or, and I know you from different um, virtual meetings and now we can meet live. So you know what the story of this undertaking is, but I think I can summarize it once again. So I'm actually connecting to what the Heinrich Böll Foundation and also Christina have developed at the time. And the idea at the time was that when we talk about European democracy, pan-European democracy, it's not sufficient to talk about the rights of the parliament, the commission, and the European institutions. We basically need a pan-European public. And we need, and this goes one step further, we need a pan-European public space. And we need a European civil society. This is what I always like to add. So when it comes to uh, implementing a European Union, irrespective of the form in detail, and if we say that this should be a democracy, then of course we also need a civil society that is European-minded. And when we need it, it's not sufficient to simply proclaim it and say, well, we are going to support it th theoretically and everyone should join in. But um, we and I have the privilege of being part of the legislator, or at least I can um, provide the groundwork for initiative, uh, but still it's a privilege. And so we said we will tackle this issue. And so we picked up the idea that many of you already know, an idea which is almost 40 years old. So at the beginning of the 80s, it started that we needed um, a European association law. In 87, there was the first statement or first resolution of the parliament. Then the commission picked it up. However, in 2004, I guess it was, or 2005, they gave up and they withdrew the proposal due to the opposition of some member states. And then a new attempt was made with non-profit associations. However, this failed as well due to opposition from the member states. And this is something that we can talk about later on. So why is the current situation different and why are we more hopeful at the moment? However, this idea that we can make a real contribution to a Europeanization of civil society and thus also foster further democratization of the European Union, this is basically the main reason for me why I wanted to do this. And the second reason is the possibility of providing protection to civil society. So this is something that is important to everyone who works in the field of NGOs within the EU. We all know that the situation is critical. We see the pressure in many states, be it from the authoritarian um, machineries or um, the bureaucratic uh, minded um, uh, um, structures. So sometimes this leads to the blind application or not benevolent um, application of certain norms in Germany, for example. Um, and if we had an additional regulation, and uh, this is basically the uh, regulation that I have proposed together, with a certain transferral of competencies or at least the review of certain measures at the level of the EU, we would offer a part of the civil society uh, more protection because um, civil society would thus not only be subjected to the arbitrariness of the respective government but would also be protected at the European level. And so this is basically the positive agenda when it comes to the um, 
the protection of the rule of law. I mean, we do not want to uh, complain about Orban 100 times. Um, I mean, we have to do this, um, but we also have to make use of our um, possibilities to shape things. So it's it's not sufficient to to only focus on confrontation, which is necessary as well, but we also want to become active, proactive. And the second instrument that we have proposed is the guideline, which is irrespective of the special status of a European association and which would improve the minimum standards, lift the minimum standards uh, up higher and would benefit NGOs, but also non-profit associations and associations in general. So this is actually the motivation and this is the result that um, is based on it. So uh, sh shall I stop here or do you have further questions or shall I continue? Okay, I will briefly continue. I assume that uh, most of you have read it, maybe, or have uh, looked into it. I mean, it's it's not a prerequisite, of course, so maybe I should give a few insights uh, um, in terms of the current state of affairs. We are in the um, public consultation phase, and this is a huge step forward from my point of view, because this is one of the few cases where the Commission has picked up a report and based on this report it is uh, prepared to draft a proposal. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I could well imagine that this proposal will go into the direction that it will not be a regulation and maybe not even an additional regulatory regime because there are some tricky aspects involved with competencies, etc. And we've already talked about it in smaller groups. But what's very important from my point of view is that um, it's, it's a, an important first step. I mean, we have to wait and see. But when we have a certain basis, a certain proposal as a basis for further deliberations, and also um, in the legislative um, sector, then we can work with that. So it's very important that we now make use of the public consultation process that the NGOs that can or want to participate do it. This is possible until the end of October. Um, it will still be possible after the end of October, even when this process of public consultation ends, you can still make suggestions. And uh, what we uh, saw and got, um, what the Commission signaled to us basically uh, is that in the second quarter of the next year, there might be a legislative proposal from the Commission. Uh, I hope that um, they will um, really be able to do that. Um, but from a tactical or strategic point of view, I think we should not lower our expectations. But in the course of the consultation process, we should demand an ambitious regulation from my point of view, which is a regulation where we provide an additional status for European association and where there is more legal certainty due to that and less discrimination of civil society, for example, uh, compared with uh, the economy. So we need a statute for associations uh, in the form of a regulation. And when this regulation does not get unanimous approval, for example, then the Commission could, as a second step, also uh, call for more cooperation and develop an additional regulatory regime for those states who can go along and then we would try to achieve this goal step by step. But this can only be done if we call for regulations because 
we cannot call for an increased cooperation. This needs to be done by the Commission as a second step. So from my point of view, this needs to be the strategy. And I'm looking forward to what you say from your point of view, what you think is necessary. But I hope that we can make a contribution that we will eventually have one regulatory framework which addresses civil society and which hopefully reduces the obstacles that civil society is faced with in different forms and this is also part of our demands. Well, thank you very much, Sergei, for this uh, first description. I think it has become quite clear and what I found very important is the defense as well as the shaping of democracy and rule of law and also the objective of Europeanization of civil society and the strengthening of the civil society, but, but also the protection of civil society in the sense of rule of law. I've got two questions. If you could um, give me more details on that. So what are the organizations that you would like to address? Will it only be about cross-border transnational organizations or will it also be about a normal Hungarian association, for example? And I would like to add a follow-up question. Maybe you can briefly tell me within two short sentences. What's the difference between, I mean, you talked about regulation and um, directive, and one needs unanimity and the other a majority. And maybe you can explain what do you mean by that? And um, you had the idea of a regulation that you have um, drafted and also of a directive. Well, the second is basically the answer to the first question. So it's a, a double approach, so to speak. We address both. The proposal addresses the new construction of an association law within the framework of a regulation. When we are able to create something at the European level, which is an additional regulatory regime, then we have to do it in the framework of a regulation. Because in the framework of the old competencies, but how can I put it? I mean, we would create a new regulatory dimension. So we do not expect from the member states that they do something which would be the classical directive, where in the course of a certain time frame, certain changes in the national law need to be implemented. But we create law because we say it will be some agency light, so to speak, at the European level. There will be a legal fact through the EU regulation, which would be a European legal form. This cannot be done via a directive. Um, I mean, this is basically a law that needs to be applied immediately. So the law applies itself, so to speak, as soon as it has passed after the trilogue and not the member states need to implement it. So the creation of this additional legal person at the European level can only be done via a regulation. So the problem is, on the one hand, the competencies and then the unanimity, which is usually needed so that it it's not always realistic. And there are also other problems with the legal basis in terms of the competencies. So some people might argue that the competencies for such a regulation in the non-profit segment of civil society is outside of the EU competencies. And this is why some argue it's not so easy to regulate it irrespective of the whole unanimity aspect. But what are we talking about here? It is about a European structure where we would like to work with low thresholds. So it would be sufficient if the founding members 
uh, we assume that it's three at least, that two have to be from two different member states, so it's easy to organize, I would say. But it's very important from my point of view that it is a low threshold option for civil society where civil society can found something uh, where um, they also find protection and where we see a certain degree of Europeanization. So this is basically the proposal for the regulation. The proposal for a directive is irrespective of that, and it would apply to all non-profit organizations and associations and foundations, for example, which are not profit-oriented, so to speak. There, it would be a directive, and the assumption would be that the member states would have to implement it gradually and comply with minimum standards, for example, no discrimination due to the funding source. Um, or due to the objectives of the association and that the members uh, that the members of the association should not be declared criminals for example because of their membership in that association so all of of course we want to um, maintain transparency and not counter anti-corruption measures but the space that we have here should be maintained. So in both versions, we have a, the wording of European non-profit organizations. And of course, we can talk about what derives from that. So <clears throat> the proposals don't touch upon the tax consequences. This is also something to do with our competencies. I mean, it, it's a proposal from the legal committee, and I cannot um, infringe on tax regulations, but this is also something to do with my concern um, how we can solve this. So if we do not have an institution which can review the nonprofit status at the European level, then we will not be able to mutually recognize the nonprofit status uh, in order to have an impact on the taxes. Otherwise, it might become a loophole for everyone who might go where we have um, lower minimum standards. They can found their nonprofit organization there and then come to Germany and get the tax exempt status, for example, or tax deductions, even though it does not comply to the standards in Germany, for example. But if we have a term for this nonprofit status, then it would be helpful. It's not only about taxes, it's about much more. If in a European law, we have a regulation or a term where, or which explicitly says that also the political work of associations is allowed, except for the a situation where it only benefits one party in order to differentiate it from direct party fundings. We would be able, uh, for the first time, to find a term in a European law that um, defines the non-profit status. And of course, a, the, we might also set up a code of conduct. Uh, the non-profit foundations, for example, have suggested that. This is an interesting path where we have a transnational recognition of the nonprofit status, which can be simplified, um, which might be a good path, uh, which is not an automatic um, mutual recognition, but a simplified path towards recognition. Thank you very much, Sergei. I think that has been very helpful. Uh, we are going to address further initiatives. It's very complex when it comes to the legal background. And there are also details uh, 
to be uh, seen. So uh, it, it can be very enlightening, but it can be also uh, extremely tiring and boring. I think this is the challenge for all of us. So I think it's at the same time also to, uh, about waking up people, and then we have to d discuss the shape. Um, so we will have two comments to speakers, um, and I'd like to start with Alexandrina Naimovic. Um, she's, as I've said before, the Secretary General for the European Civic Forum. It's a pan-European network with over 100 NGOs that work on this civil society engagement. And, and um, Alexandrina, uh, I'm not able to see you on the screen. Could you be so kind? Would you be so kind and uh, say some things? So we'll see you. Ah, there you are. So, Hello. Okay, perfect. <laughs> I'm here. Hello. Uh, thank you so much. From a perspective of a pan European network um, um, working for the European civil society, what are your expect expectatives? What do you expect? What is your perspective? Hello, thank you very much for inviting me to this important conversation. Um, so indeed, we are a European network. Actually, we are a European association without the statute, uh, as we operate essentially across the border. We, we are a membership-based uh, association of more than 100 associations all across Europe, but we are identified uh, as uh, French law association because we are registered in France and there's no recognition at the European level uh, at the moment for uh, this kind of cross-border activities. Um, it's been more than 10 years, 15 years that we are campaigning, uh, joining forces with the foundations and the mutuals as well to have uh, supranational legal forms to give recognition to our forms of organization. I was um, very uh, pleasantly uh, impressed by the first words uh, that Sergei Lagodinsky used to introduce his proposals that would contribute to give a pan-European dimension to the civic engagement and so to create public space, which is quite in contrast with what we see in the description of the European Commission uh, rationale for the public consultation where the first element that comes is the aspect that associations can contribute um, by providing them access to the free market, they can contribute to create growth and jobs. Additionally, of course, to engage individuals to participate in European uh, public life. So I think that here we really do have a problem of um, simply understanding what associations, civil society, and not-for-profit organizations generally mean. Um, and uh, I really like to reinforce what Sergei just said, that we would really need at the European level and in EU law uh, to have a form, a legal form of recognition, a definition of what not-for-profit means to be able to distinguish us uh, actors from the state on one side uh, and ensure our independence and operation uh, and from the market. So um, this, is, uh, this is not an easy thing uh, to answer given the complexity, the various forms of organization of not-for-profit uh, organizations across, uh, across Europe and terminology and so on and so forth. So probably there would be, uh, it would be impossible to respond with a one uh, single legal initiative. Uh, that would fit all. But just this is just to say that there are so many needs uh, in the civic sector, starting from this phenomenon of, of shrinking civic space that uh, Sergei tried to address through uh, the Directive for Minimum Standards, which would be really great to have in, in national laws something that directly recognizes um, standards for uh, creation of associations, their independence uh, for from uh, national authorities and their freedom to access funding, foreign funding and their freedom to do political activities. If we think about only these two main particular trends that are cross border that we see all across Europe, uh, shrinking the space of civil society, being identified as foreign agents if they access foreign funding more and more and not only in Hungary and Poland, 
um, and also uh, being accused of having political activities or uh, being political simply because they do campaigning on issues that regard our way of building societies and observing fundamental rights. So having these minimum standards across Europe recognized would be really a great achievement, even though we do have them in international law and European Charter of Fundamental Rights. But I think that if we can have a European directed, directive transport, transposed in national law, that would be an additional tool for organizations to uphold these uh, tendencies and attacks that we see more and more from state actors, but also non-state actors. Now, regarding uh, the regulation and this um, legal form or supranational legal form for what we used to call and we still call European Association. Um, it's been so long time that we, we expect this. And first of all, we look at it as a tool to give recognition, uh, to give recognition simply to the freedom to associate cross-border, to the freedom to create the European public sphere, to contribute to it, and then to be recognized as such to participate in policy making from the side of European organizations that already exist, European networks of associations that gather transnationally for decades associations to interact with the European institutions, that would be a huge step forward. Additionally to this kind of political uh, legitimacy and recognition, we have all these elements of uh, obstacles that organizations face in having cross-border activities, including fundraising, uh, including being recognized, including um, opening up um, uh, offices in other member states of so the whole uh, issues that revolve around the mutual recognition. So having a supranational legal form would address a lot of these issues. Um, we were just a little bit concerned um, about um, some aspects of the um, um, supervision bodies that would be needed both at the national level and at the European level to, uh, to register and to supervise the, the creation and the operation of such organization uh, in order to be sure that these supervisory bodies are really nationally independent from the governments and uh, also at the European level free from any kind of um, in-due interference and if possible also composed of civil society organizations. In the whole context that we know uh, that governments and institutions use more and more um, registration and transparency requirements in order to shrink the space for civil society and put uh, a burden on their operation and on, on their freedom of expression. So that would be a, a point to, to have in mind when uh, providing any kind of response to, to the European Parliament um, uh, demands. Also, there has been a lot, a lot of um, advancement on recognizing, for example, that European legislation can unintentionally create um, negative consequences on the, free, on, on the associative life at the national level, for example, through the transposition of money laundering and terrorism uh, or uh, combating terrorism legislation. So this was also very useful to be reminded in uh, in the European Parliament's reports. Now, just to end um, regarding the, the European Commission consultation and proposals, as I said, uh, I am a little bit worried that um, too much emphasis is put on the, on the single market aspect. Uh, nevertheless, um, there are some, some good perspectives to, to, to seize, namely the fact that the, the concept of not-for-profit is posed and, uh, and will be recognized. As I said, I think it would be needed at European level a supranational uh, legal form for not-for-profit simply, not necessarily to limit it to associations, uh, because also in some countries, you have uh, organizations that uh, under the name of foundations, for example, they do um, not necessarily only grant making activities, but also activity that, that in other countries would be uh, assimilated as uh, civic associations. So uh, we are currently uh, reflecting and consulting our members uh, all across Europe and also in the frame of civil society Europe, we will respond to this public consultation, having in mind um, 
the needs not only to create an enabling environment for civil society, so to make sure that any kind of supranational or legislative initiative that will uh, be proposed will not uh, contribute even unintentionally to, to bring uh, extra burdens on civil society, but hopefully rather to to help unlock the potential for cross-border cooperation and also to ease um, their operation nationally uh, by recognizing their right to uh, not only provide services, but also challenge uh, governments and uh, institutions to play their democratic role and be accountable. So uh, we would tend to be in favor of a, of a legal, new legal supranational form to address all these needs but also having in mind that maybe putting all these aspects in, into one single legal form would be complicated. Also having in mind these tax um, issues that are equally important to address. So um, I'm, I'm not able to give simple answers, but uh, we really hope that all these issues will be addressed uh, in a way or another in the uh, proposal by the Commission. Thank you so much, Alexandrina. It has been very clear that there is um, some tension between the political desires and wishes and the legal possibilities and the factual possibilities. On one hand, maybe that to have just one legal form, um, and, and Sergei talked about that bef uh, before, um, um, there is, is a separation due to legal issues and the other aspect on the other hand is about the market participants, the non-profit organizations, the directive uh, is based on the article 114, the market participants and um, it has been said, uh, you've talked about that, you addressed that, um, and um, it's again about the competencies of the EU, you've mentioned that before. On the other hand, it has been very obvious that it uh, would be very important to have this pan-European network and um, to recognize them legally and um, um, to give them a legal status. Um, this has been very, very clear uh, in your statement. And then uh, in, when it comes to the details um, of the of the board, I, I found this very interesting that the transparency and the um, registration um, through um, uh, uh, authoritarian governments, this is used by them in order to control them. And uh, Marta, I'd like to invite you to contribute. She is the uh, co-head um, of the Hungarian um, um, Helsinki Committee, the co-chair, and she works on um, the, um, state, um, the rule of law. And the Helsinki Committee works intensively uh, on the topic dignity, human dig dig dignity and civil engagement. And Mar Marta, um, from a perspective of an organization that is working in a political environment under pressure in Hungary and needing protection, what uh, about your expectations with regard to this new initiatives on new initiative european initiative on um, on the right of associations thank you very much uh, christina and and thank you very much for the invitation and and foremost for the initiative um to have heightened uh, levels of protection and also more space for civil society um, I'm sitting in Budapest now, and as we all know, just yesterday, the European Parliament voted by a very significant majority, um, basically concluding what has been um, a, a sad and painful knowledge that Hungary is no longer, can no longer be considered as a fully fledged democracy. Um, the, I, I would propose that our aim in the European Union should be to ensure that this um, trend is reversed both in Hungary and it doesn't happen anywhere else in the European Union. And I see this initiative to, to provide more 
space, more protection, more cross-border um, activity space for nonprofit organizations in the European Union in this light. So how do we need to strengthen democracy and citizen participation in the European Union? My answer to this would be yes. Is there a need for more rules, more policies to foster these initiatives at the European level beyond what the current national or European level rules would allow? I think the answer is very clearly yes. And so I would say that there is clearly a need for this kind of legislation. And it does fill not only a gap, but it is crucial. It is a form of investment in our, in our democratic society. Citizens and citizens associations are key to ensure that uh, democracy is strengthened and flourishes in the European Union. And so we do need more activities in support of this. And the EU is very good at putting forward legal tools. And we should, we should absolutely put this tool to use and, and implement it. So I think there is a need for rules at EU level and I su absolutely support this initiative. And we've been discussing with many organizations, not only in Hungary, but also across the European Union working um, at national level, the need for more legal protection for uh, the, the freedom of association in EU law itself, because the Council of Europe and the Venice Commission and other um, UN rules are simply not enough. And we have specific issues within the European Union that should be custom um, addressed. We also see this as a, a part of a, a larger strategy, a crucial element of a larger strategy to foster civil society space in the EU. And so the legal initiatives should be complemented by others, such as better consultation mechanisms and better and more sustainable funding. But the legal tools are extremely important. And the reason for this is that um, there was, of course, already a lot of mention of the single market. And this is something that the commission in the consultation um, also looks at there, we, we need a, a good single market, a favorable, supportive single market for um, nonprofit organizations, because there is already a very vibrant market, uh, a single market in the EU for harmful practices in democracy and civil society space. So even without regulation, there is, we can see how um, harmful practices can be imported into the EU space from outside of it, and also how they can easily spread across borders. And Alexandrina had already mentioned a number of them. And it's enough to think about how transparency rules, foreign funding focus, gongos, government organized NGOs um, are uh, propping up uh, in increasing number of EU member states in the past few years. And we've seen how current um, pushbacks in the form of infringement actions, for example, are not enough. It is therefore imperative to have heightened standards across the EU. And I really like, in this sense, this minimum standards idea, particularly because they really fortify the EU law pillars and fundaments of of freedom of association and therefore um, just uh, make it easier, clearer and stronger for freedom of association to be protected by the European Union institutions, ultimately um, through national courts or the commission at the Court of Justice. And I think this is still key, but of course we need to move beyond this. And we just saw, for example, in the last few months, um, when it comes to, to volunteering and civil society activities responding to the war um, on Ukraine and the Ukrainian refugees who are arriving in the European Union, how difficult it is to actually set up an emergency operation from a very classic um, organizational practical element. So while there's big organizations being able to mobilize even hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of euros, it's very difficult for them to 
so to say, set up shop and to respond to emergencies, simply because if you look at how difficult it is to hire people, to act as, a, as an economic actor, um, to, pay, to pay social security taxes, to open bank accounts, these obstacles also need to be overcome. And I think there is a, beyond the protective elements uh, to push back against the, the, the shrinking of civic space, we also need to ensure that civil society can really act where it is doing its work best and sometimes even much better than other actors, government or, or corporations. And so alleviating the burdens of this through mutual recognition, for example, of public benefit status is I think really important. It would allow for citizens not only to engage with, but also to support civil society that is under pressure if you think about how a German um, uh, citizen or uh, even a, a for-profit co corporation is able to support the cause of democracy within the EU, I think the, the opportunities today are more restricted than they should be. It's simply because um, the, the tax and other incentive structures are very uh, focused on the national level and don't really allow for cross-border support at a time where we need more cross-border transnational mobilization for, for citizen action. This is really not so easy to do on the supportive um, financial support side. And so as a last thought, I would add that although of course civil society organization is very often or most often done through associations, but foundations, the, the private entities that help um, organizations to, to access resources and mobilize financial resources are also important and they can also come under pressure. I know this very well from Hungary. And so I think just as a last thought, it's important also to, to encompass and, and cover all um, nonprofit ac actors um, in, in the whole chain of, of mobilization, including foundations. Thank you. Vielen Dank, Martha. Thank you very much, Marta, for these impressive words. And this has made quite clear how different the situations in different European member states are. So the civil society in Hungary is a completely different situation um, than in Germany or in Belgium, for example. So this made very clear once again also from your um, perspective how the important the aspect of minimum standards is because it's about basic freedoms freedom of association for example so this has become quite clear and also the mutual recognition this is also something that alexandrina has brought up this is a very important aspect so this leads to cross border support of civil society organizations also in terms of taxes and donations for example and funding so thank you first of all before you can react to it Sergei, i would suggest that we also hear about the german context i would like to welcome ansgar klein once again he's the uh, chairman or the managing director of the Federal Network for Civic Engagement. It's sim similar to the European Civic Forum, but it's at the German level. It's a network from different organizations that focus on civil society engagement. And this is what the Federal Network would like to promote and foster. Um, so you've long been looking into the issue. So my question now is how? Can this debate, the debate that we are having here, the objectives, the needs that have been mentioned, how can this be brought in line with the debate in Germany? So we already heard that there have been different initiatives. We have a nice text in our web dossier on this topic uh, by Mirko Schwerze, who has also long worked. Um, for the network. So there have been several initiatives and 
they also failed because of German opposition. The German association law has quite a long tradition, and in particular when, when it comes to um, non-profit, it's, it's um, a very important uh, aspect here. So what's your assessment in terms of this initiative and how can this be uh, assessed in the German context? Thank you very much. Also from my side, I would like to uh, greet all of you. The topic is very important and for civil society, it is a normative precondition, prerequisite to have a low threshold uh, association law which provides for protections but also for positive uh, rights so on the one hand it creates a sphere for protection but also in the public appearance it leads to a positive uh, um, effect and it is a low threshold organization and as I heard, the European Association Law Plans with three people, we with seven. So it's definitely the right direction that there are three people involved in the planning, but it's um, a construction that we need for uh, all of Europe, basically. And in terms of the German debate, I can say, according to the latest service, we have more than 600,000 associations. Association is the legal form that everyone chooses, which complies with um, uh, minimum standards uh, in order to also get public funding, for example, which usually is also connected to the nonprofit status. So the connection with nonprofit is well advanced in Germany. So. For example, in the field of development policy, development aid, funding is only provided if you uh, are a non-profit organization um, or are accredited as a non-profit organization. And this brings me to the first problem. This is also maybe an empirical problem, uh, which is not really trivial for the associations. This is um, a German issue, which might also uh, be found elsewhere in Europe. So via statistics, we have learned that some areas are under particular pressure, which is, for example, the board membership in associations. This is due to aging, the demographic situation, but all in all, it's a real challenge because it's quite time intense, intensive um, engagement here. So this is not a trivial issue. So when you talk about commitment and democracy, um, this is a very important aspect. So we have to ask ourselves, how can we make sure that this time, time intensive work of a uh, association board membership uh, can be guaranteed? I mean, from my organization, um, I, know, I mean, we were not a registered association because churches, for example, said we are not going to participate in such an organization. And then we got registered and then we were told that we now are liable for certain aspects. So a non-registered uh, association in connection with other aspects, um, this is quite an issue here. So this should not be underestimated. And then in the German debate, we faced an issue when it comes to uh, the association law and the non-profit status. So there was a discussion, which was completely wrong from my point of view, which said that uh, non-profit organizations should not be able to work in the political sector, which is quite contradic contradictory from my point of view. Large civil society organizations like Compact, for example, gave up their non-profit status in order to avoid um, reviews by uh, the institutions, by the state. And now we come to the basic aspects. I mean, I'm a political scientist myself, just to give you uh, some of my background. And I've worked a lot in the civil society field. And when we talk about political decision spheres and participation, then of course, we really have to make a distinction between the participation in the decision-making process. There we have civil society and the participation, uh, or rather the participation in the will formation that we have civil society and in the decision-making processes, we do not have so much civil society involved. I mean, it's a difficult uh, 
debate which we could have, but I don't want to start it. And the AFD, for example, right-wing party, just as an example, is a fan of direct democracy in order to implement their populist policies. And they actually want to protect this direct democracy structures for the future. But just as a side remark, so basically it should be possible and can be possible that civil society actors work in the form of associations and also non-profit associations and thus also participate in the political um, will formation process because in the sociology of civil society we have the advocatory actions so many civil society actors speak on behalf of or for for the weak people in society for human rights organizations and others and um, this list is um, not does not end here so they participate in the will formation and decision formation and this is an obligation for civil society and we defend it against any attack i have to say that bluntly we have to do this um, so this was quite a drastic uh, statement here, but I did it like that in order to show that if we have a European association law, which is welcomed, of course, uh, we have to provide the protections and the necessary space. We need uh, low thresholds. Uh, however, the political dimension should be included uh, in our deliberations. So associations of course, cannot replace parties. This is not the issue here. But associations that participate in the will formation and decision-making process and um, provide insights and do research, and um, this is part of our civil society experience, and they need to do it in the future as well. And this leads to value added for civil society. Uh, and I would like to come to another aspect, association law as a kind of protection and also protected space, of course, is a challenge for authoritarian regimes. This is why European association law would be an additional form of protection for civil society actors in authoritarian regimes. And the colleague from the respective countries, of course, can assess this much better than I. But I think that the EU as a community of values and a legal community, and these are the topics that we're talking about, um, it's, it's very important in the EU that we can make contributions and um, that we comply with our values. So this should be... Uh, safeguarded and allowed here. This would be a great step and we need a strengthening of the civil society and put more protections in the authoritarian regimes within the EU, not only there, but especially there because the association law will address them. And um, unfortunately, due to regime changes, the challenges uh, grow for them and we cannot accept that. So this new law could even be an antidote in order to hamper these developments. So, of course, we will not be able to achieve this without any conflict in the EU. Um, for example, we still uh, debate whether we can sanction violations of um, rule of law in, in Germany, but we cannot only stand at the sideline and watch it. So we have to make a contribution here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ansgar Klein. I think this has made quite clear how the debate about this non-profit aspect, and this was also brought up in the chat, uh, should be implemented in public benefit or implemented as a public benefit. And non-profit is a broader term. Um, well, last time when we failed, this was basically due to the inability to come to an agreement. And from the German perspective, it's very important to take into account the political perspective because organizations, civil society participates in the political will formation process. And it would be insane to neglect this political dimension from nonprofit organizations or in, in connection with the nonprofit organizations. When it comes to the nation states, uh, and Germany is one of them, who are always afraid that their standards are not maintained or that the EU regulations are below their minimum standards, that 
we have this higher um, obligation to defend the rule of law uh, in the EU. And this is an additional aspect that needs to be taken into account. Before we open the round, I would like to give Sergei the opportunity to react to one of the other aspects that we have just uh, talked about and that we've seen in the comments. And then we would like to open it for Zoom and for the people here in the room. I did not not want to say that much. I wanted to simply say thank you to Marta and Alexandrina and also uh, our colleague Ansel Klein for the support, especially Marta and Alexandrina, uh, who are in the field where it's the most difficult um, and who have the best legitimacy. They are as much more than I uh, do, uh, who is living in Berlin Friedrichshain and is working in Brussels and modeling through. So you uh, have to face the consequences of the authoritarian trend and authoritarian trend and the shrinking public spaces. So your support for this initiative is basically the most important thing from my point of view. It's it's most dearest, it's the dearest thing to me. So thank you very much for that. And this is why I closely listened to what you said. I mean, I'm a little bit more cautious when it comes to criticizing the commission, when the commission tries to uh, connect to the market role of the associations. I mean, uh, we know why the commission is doing it. It's traumatized after the two failures in the member state. And last time in the German Bundesrat, the justification was for the failure was that uh, the associations are not non-profit organizations, have nothing to do with the market. And so the EU uh, should not get involved here in these regulations. So and this would be a way out. And this is also something that I uh, emphasized in our regulation, which is basically like an umbrella. I mean, there are two erroneous ideas. So the EU is not simply a market um, oriented structure and everything that is not connected to the market should not be governed by the EU. Over the past 10 years, we have seen that it's very important that we are a democracy union, that we are a value based union. Also, the European Court of Justice has confirmed that. So, we have to liberate ourselves from this cage of this market economy thinking. And the second erroneous idea is that. Just because an organization is non-profit, uh, it should have nothing to do uh, with the market or because it's for the public benefit. Uh, no, they still have to do with the market. They are market stakeholders and non-profit or for the public benefit does not mean that I cannot generate profits as long as I reinvest the profits into my mm, non-profit uh, work. But this, of course, means that I participate in the market. So this is would actually be too short-sighted when we would say these organizations have nothing to do with the, the market, with the economy. So Alexandrina, of course, understand your criticism. And uh, to a large extent, I do share your criticism, but I think this is a kind of a way out. I mean, this is a possibility or a chance to, to uh, rescue this project from the opposition of the member states. And this might also explain why Breton is responsible for this undertaking. So initially, I was quite a bit shocked why an industrial commissioner and market commissioner would be responsible for that. But then I rethought it, and I thought we can make use of it because, and I explained it to him, I explained the two objectives that are very important to us, and he shares 
these objectives and he understood what we want to achieve and if the market can help us in that well so be it uh, i'm quite pragmatic when it comes to that uh, it simply needs to be clear that we do not want to govern everything based on market rules but if uh, it is being opened up, and if uh, it's, it's just included, I would be prepared to do that. That I don't know if Alexandrina uh, uh, agrees. You look quite skeptical, but I would um, say that we should have a more tactical approach here. Well, and yes, what Marta says, um, from my point of view, the nonprofit foundations or the public benefit foundations need to be included here. So we should not only look at the associations, but um, we might be, or the commission might focus on the associations due to pragmatic reasons, but I think we should also think of a foundation, in particular when it comes to Hungar Hungary, for example, when we look at the situation of the foundations and how Hungary treats foundations, we know that this is also a democracy problem and we know how important these foundations are for civil society and also for the nonprofit or public benefit objectives. So I like to work with uh, these foundations at the European level and I would say that this should also be part of the consultation process, the public consultation. We should point out the commission that the foundations should be um, part of our deliberations. So thank you very much. I am very happy to listen to the statements, comments, and questions from all the participants here in the room. So please put up your name tag so I can see who would like to speak. And in Zoom, I would like to ask you to raise your hand or to uh, submit your comments in writing, and we will collect them. So uh, I'd uh, like to start with Zoom. I try to be very kind with um, by starting with Zoom. And uh, Kathleen from the Red Cross and Francesca. Uh, uh, I'll have to check, I think. I cannot find it, but of, of course you can introduce yourself. So I'd like to give the floor to both of you. Thank you so much. Katro Vatovek from the Red Cross. Um, and I've written Red Cross um, with um, uh, intention because this uh, initiative is very interesting for us from different point of views. It has been said that it's uh, difficult, that um, it's been placed in this market area. And um, for us, um, as a service provider, uh, it's something positive. And all the debate that is taking place uh, within the sphere of the social economy and um, with a planning with regard to that. And we, as a service provider um, of a public benefit, uh, we, of course, have to deal with um, competitors uh, that are uh, non-profit or that are for profit. So it's very difficult to have a line there to uh, define what is the difference of public interest, public, public benefit, um, non-profit status. And it has been said before um, by Sergei, um, a definition, a European definition, what means public benefit, to be of public benefit. This is something that would be very, very helpful to us. As a market um, participant, we are treated um, under the regulations. Uh, and in order to strengthen our position, it would would be very helpful to have a European understanding. Um, it's about benefits that have to be reinvested, and it would be a huge advantage. Um, it would strengthen our work and um, our activities uh, within the market. And this is one perspective, one stone of, um, point of view. I'm very, very thankful for this debate. Uh, and. Um, 
uh, it's always um, forgotten um, in the debate about the European social economy. Um, um, there are, of course, actors that um, do have benefits and others that don't. Um, and um, everything that anything that changes the civil society is very relevant to us. And um, beyond Hungary, where we see problems um, as a humanitarian organization uh, when it comes to immigration um, and um, certain irregularities there. And we have we faced problems there. And Martha mentioned that before. And we any kind of legal tool, anything that strengthens the civil society is an advantage, and especially, especially when it comes from um, the EU background. Thank you very much. Francesca, she has written, she's from the European Center, not for profit uh, now, and um, you've got the floor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I uh, am from the European Centre for Not-for-Profit Law, ECNL, and we have had the pleasure to uh, meet, discuss in the past with uh, um, uh, Sergei and his staff regarding the upcoming proposals. Let me clarify, the European Centre for Not-for-Profit Law is registered based in the Netherlands, so we are officially Dutch organisation. But we have a European remit because we advocate for enabling environment in Europe and better standards for that. We work with the NGOs at grassroots level. We provide technical assistance. We even have projects in partnership. But we wouldn't fall technically under the definition of the European Association presented in the current proposal because we are not a member based organization. So um, having said this, we we are uh, now preparing our submission to the Commission consultation, which we understand aims to establish the feasibility and so to assess the impact of potential different uh, regulatory instruments to uh, um, the purpose of uh, regulating civic space. So when it comes to the pan-Europeanization of uh, civic space, which is a concept that we very much like and support, we uh, look with particular favor um, at the other proposal for minimum standards of, for uh, uh, non-profit organizations. Because we agree with what Marta said in the presentation, the problems are widespread affecting all NGOs uh, in European Union states. They, in, in terms of uh, hindrances, obstacles to their general activities, their funding, uh, access to funding, even transporters. We saw that there are even issues about definitions or understanding of what not-for-profit organizations are across borders. So we believe that the directive on minimum standards would uh, definitely have to be prioritized in terms of creating this uh, pan-European even understanding of civil society and protecting the activities of civil societies. Uh, we also share the concern expressed by Alexandrina, if I understood it correctly, that at least in the current stage of the proposal on European Association Statute, it's not clear how effectively independent the national association bodies would be and the additional layer of the European supervisory body. So if anything, that aspect should be clarified because it risks creating an additional layer of uh, control and supervisions and probably negative influence on civil society. But I would like to conclude by asking uh, the panelists and uh, Sergei Lagodinsky, this question. If the Commission decided to go ahead just with the uh, minimum standard directive, um, how would you still see an added value in having a regulation establishing a European association statute? Thank you. 
Vielen Dank. Wir nehmen jetzt noch Thank you so much. Um, they are two others who'd like to contribute. Um, Bernd Arndt. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christina and Sergey. Thank you so much, Ansgar, for your contribution. I talk here on behalf of an association that exists since 1949, and um, we are registered in the Netherlands. Uh, we're active in Brussels, and um, we have uh, a long tradition. And we go a long way back, and this is very important uh, as an issue to us to work cross-borderly. And we've learned that, um, uh, of course, in the ec economic sphere, it goes further. We've learned that that civil uh, society means something very different in different countries and um, the uh, legal framework is also different and um, we see associations that have to go and register in in germany in order to be active there and um, at least this is my perception of course um, i'd like to be corrected and it's very important that the protection um, for um, organization is guaranteed and uh, during the debate um, it's always interesting that this is one of the key issues and, and of course it is very um, important but uh, we don't I, for, at least for my understanding we don't use democracy as a term um, um, way um, to less and um, the um, we have a foundation for climate protection in Mecklenburg pre Pomerania this is some kind of running gag for example uh, they if you do something right for 100 times then you then you can do something uh, very mean and then the separation between market and and the civil society which is something artificial from my understanding this triangle it's um, it's like an invention you may like it or not but we've heard it from hungary it's very interesting of course there are gongos and um it's um and it will increase um um and this is, of course, um, uh, uh, some kind of risk. And then the um, assertive democracy. Um, we've heard that the uh, freedom of um, uh, association is very boring, and it has the um, association, uh, the right of, um, of foundations has been ch changed. And then we have so. We have uh, not a lot of democracy in the German foundation law. Um, um, it's not very democratically organized, but it is very important. It's about having funding and um, having space and, and doing stuff. And But um, it's also some kind of entry gate, of pathway for um, personalities like Orban um, to say you're not anchored in society. And um, I've noticed that again, um, also by reading um, the proposal, Democracy is not very often mentioned. Of course, we talk about democracy for individuals, for countries, but it's not when it comes to associations. And there's the Deutsche Jugendung. They call it the workshop for democracy. It's, again, an, a boring association, a representation um, for activists and initiatives, and, um, and um, that, that starts starts with five members. But um, so I'd like to put it in the uh, left-wing liberal corner. So. Um, Everything else that has been mentioned is very wonderful, of course. Therefore, it's important to us. Uh, we have it very clear. Um, we uh, we need a European association law. Um, it has uh, to um, help the democratic self-organization to create an infrastructure. With this regard, Ansgar mentioned that it uh, can be used also by others, by associations that are um, of public benefit and not uh, exactly political. It has to be uh, possible to have this freedom. And we also ask um, uh, with the MFR, uh, we, you need a bonus for democracy for those kinds of um, organizations that are um, self-organized democratically and uh, Croatia, Czechoslovakia, there is a process um, of uh, initiation and there is no bonus for democracy for um, um, aid uh, in situ. It's, Ansgar mentioned it, it's a lot of work, it's um, volunteer work, and it's not about having a managing director, it's about giving time, and there is no bonus. In, in Germany, there is a bonus, um, um, but 
in in uh, in in the EU, it's not possible. Even the uh, European Council is stronger. And during the last thirty years, we've um, have forgotten about that. That this association law in in uh, this boring association law is not honoured as a workshop of democracy in a lot of countries. And I don't notice this in in the proposal in the documents. And I don't. I'm not sure. Um, as the uh, Commission is very um, technocratical, it's. Um, uh, I think we have to give an impulse there. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm from the Menchonata uh, Foundation. We are think tank of this uh, civil society, philanthropy, and other issues. And um, I'd like uh, to thank uh, Sergei Lagodinsky for this initiative and uh, congratulations to have furthered this issue. Um, so much. Um, it's not just something nice. I'm um, saying because we urgently we need a debate about the legal development of um, the organizations of civil society i'd like to remember that the german law of association came into the bgb at the end of the 19th century in the reichstag uh, in parliament there was a lot of criticism a member of parliament said this is a right for those who like to drink and smoke and do other stuff and, and like to bowl but it's not for those um, um for those who really do something but uh, a lot of happened and the civil society has changed a lot then um, um, and the associations are different today than they were in the 19th century. And we see in the legal development that things have changed too. And so we, and if we want to continue to develop, of course, it has to become European and it cannot continue to be only national. Um, we've seen it with civil society and with other issues. And uh, we are here for that. and. Um, and um, we have 600,000 associations that are registered. They are mentioned all the time. There are um, hundreds of thousands of others. Uh, think about Friday of Future. They are not regi registered as an association. With the registration, they would get in in trouble because um, they 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 don't have um, assemblies uh, in situ, and um, they cannot do so. And um, so that is also a fight. Is uh, is this a non-register or is this another kind of association uh, following the German uh, BGB um, as a civil code of Germany? These are things we have to address. And um, I'd like to focus on two topics. We we are talking about two topics in within this initiative. Uh, we have the um, regulation for a European association statute. Um, it has failed before, and we have another um, proposal that has um, failed. It hasn't passed through the Council, and Germany were among the countries that um, hindered um, this, and we, we have a we have thousands, not only associations, but other forms of uh, people who work across uh, border and the council. Very uh, probably they will, um, of course, block this again because it's based on uh, unanimity, unanimity. And this means that the second part, the standards, uh, they are uh, in the center of the um, interest and of the uh, possibilities to implement this. And I think it's therefore interesting to debate about this. But I'd like to have a broader debate. Uh, quite a, a lot of associations um, gave their opinion, um, criticized, um, addressed the problems. But uh, during the next months, uh, Beyond the consultation, we I think we have to address this to find a good foundation and a good solution. And I think this will be a huge step forward. Um, and this would make it visible to that we are um, trying to have a European solution and uh, to 
that we're trying to create a European solution, uh, summing everything up, um, the market role. This is also something pragmatic, maybe not even that bad. And um, uh, in theory, of course, it's a disaster. The civil society cannot be pushed into the market. It's uh, difficult um, uh, with regard to some aspects that, for example, uh, a, a huge organization of public interest um, for um, public welfare is a market um, actor. But the separation has to be clear. The civil society has, uh, is driven in a different way, and it has to be obvious. It cannot be something added to the market, um, an addendum to the market. And the second. Um, part are uh, donations um, about across borders. It has been mentioned before, and this is a problem too. We uh, have to deal. The civil society um, has already found a solution, a quite traumatic solution to that. It's not as urgent as it is very often um, declared, but it can be um, better organized, and it's um, something. Um, we, but it shouldn't be seen as uh, 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 too, too big um, of a burden. It's not only about the donations, it's about more. Uh, it's about civil society to, to, to uh, secure a, a place for civil society in the public sphere. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. I think that we have had a first round of comments and uh, remarks, and this has pointed out the skepticism in terms of the market participation, and that from a democracy point of view, this is not a good signal. Uh, what was also interesting were the question in terms of the minimum standards. Mr. Strachwitz said that this is a step ahead. Francesca asked what would be the value added if we would only be able to come to an agreement on the minimum standards, what would be the value added here? And um, I think something else was still unclear in terms of the boards. The question was whether there will only be a national one but also, or also a European one and how it can be protected from abuse and the European definition of non-profit or public benefit. This is a huge issue here, and I would like to pass you the floor. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. So now we, we really get going here. It's really about the details also in the political reality. That's great. So what Kathleen has already mentioned. So thank you. It's great to see you uh, digitally. So I, I do share your view. It was very important to uh, have a European definition of non-profit or public benefit. And the um, impact of that can be debated, of course, and I'm looking forward to, to discussions and reactions that we can take along uh, for uh, later uh, deliberations. One thing is very clear. I mean, the word pragmatic has been mentioned uh, several times and already said why this market dimension would be important for the legal basis. But um, pragmatic also means something else from the perspective of the timeline. If we want to achieve something, we should try to make progress with the legislative process within this legislative period. Why? Please look at the next council presidencies. We will have Poland, Hungary, right after the after that elections. I'm not fully sure of the sequence, but this would lead to major problems or might lead to major problems. So at this point, I would actually suggest that we try to make progress as quickly as possible. So what happens if the Commission only um, picks up the directive? So as far as I understood, and these are the signals or the way I interpret the signals uh, from there, uh, I think we should try to think both together and maybe try to 
come to a legal form at the national level connected to certain standards that we can implement. So these are the signals that I uh, get from Brussels or the way I interpret it. It will not only be a directive on minimum standards, but there will be an add-on which will be pan-European or at least which will um, make the cross-border cooperation easier. And then, of course, we will be able to discuss that. And then in the parliament, the important thing will be that we try to raise these standards and to add additional dimensions to that. So if there would be no regulation, I mean, well, we'll have to wait and see how it will look like then in the end. But of course, there are means and ways how we can incorporate the pan-European perspective even when we only uh, discuss a directive on minimum standards. But other than that, it's difficult to say. In terms of democracy, yes, well, all in all, it's a question, what are the minimum standards also for the inner setup of associations or what can we um, uh, what can we lay out in our proposals? But another question that is very important to me is uh, value neutrality. So, well, the value neutral regulation. I mean, this is something that could be so or was solved differently in the two proposals. I mean. Even when it comes to the definition of non-profit, many people said that Article 2 or democratic values or the Charter of Human Rights uh, or Civil Rights or the EU Charter should be included. So everyone who does not feel reflected or does not agree to it are no non-profit organizations, but I'm too liberal for that, basically. We cannot go that far uh, from my point of view. Of course, I still remember Annette Kahane uh, brought up the example, which is quite striking. She said during panel discussions that in Eastern Germany, there was no civil society or just a weak civil society. No, that is completely wrong. There's quite a strong civil society. There are whole associations focusing on the youth, on social issues. Uh, who are active in the communities and the municipalities. But the problem is, is they are right-wing extremists or right-wing um, nationalists. So, I mean, this is part of civil society, basically. We have to admit that. But then, of course, we have to try to find different tools in order to counter that. But I think it would be wrong to say in the definition of nonprofit that they cannot be nonprofit. This is not in line with my understanding of our constitution or the constitution of the EU, basically, or the way the EU sees itself. But what we said is that if it's a European association, then the association who says, well, we want to get the special protection of the EU and the special status, they must not violate the values of Article 2. And this is part of the regulation proposal. So when it comes to privileges, the special protection and the special Europeanization of the association, there, of course, they have to comply with the uh, treaties and Article 2. But when it comes to the directive and the minimum standards, I would say we cannot make any exclusions when it comes to the nonprofit status. But this is, of course, a very interesting topic, and we should uh, continue to work on that. So there was the question about uh, Germany and Germany preventing the uh, implementation. But under this government, this would not happen, of course, because it's part of the coalition agreement that they want to support this project. And we also managed to get through with the reform of the non-profit status. And um, I still remember the meetings of the working group. And the foreign office is in the leadership here and the leading role. Well, uh, when it comes to the coalition agreement, it 
it's part of the part on Europe? But uh, is it the uh, Foreign Office, the uh, Foreign Ministry? Um, then we have a problem. Well, I, no, I don't understand that um, because the Foreign Office, I mean, when it comes to the coalition agreement, you shouldn't see it that narrowly. So in the part on Europe, it says that we commit ourselves to the association law and that we want to have a European association law. And of course, uh, they will, uh, Lehmann will, uh, will surely support it. And with Mr. Bushman, I, I talked about it, but uh, I, I'm sure that they will not reject it, I'm, I'm sure. And when it comes to non-profit or the public benefit, it's mentioned in two different segments in the part on uh, domestic policy, but also in the part on democracy. So it's quite clear um, part of the um, coalition agreement. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes left and we have a request to speak in Zoom. And Georg has collected a few questions that were submitted in writing in the chat. So now I would like to give the floor to Georg and then to the Zoom request to speak. Now we would have the last opportunity here in the room to raise your hand and then we will have another round with our speakers. Did you want to say something? Well, I forgot one thing when it comes to the board and the independence of the board. Well, our proposal is that, I mean, such a board will only come to action if there is regulation based on our, our solution, because then you have to administer or manage the register at the European level and have an overview or also the oversight rather uh, at the European level. So we want to ha wanted to have a, a streamlined structure. Of course, you have to get a majority also from the conservatives and the liberals who are usually against these kind of agencies. So this was a solution that is basically based on the GDPR. And the solution is that the member states have to report to one agency which is responsible for it. In Germany, it would be the local administrative courts. Um, so existing authorities at, who are responsible at the national level. And these authorities will send one representative to the board plus three representatives from the EU institutions. Of course, you could say that they are not so independent compared to independent experts. But if you have 27 plus three members on that board, it will be very difficult, let's say, for a government in of country X, Y, Z to implement their views. I mean, either they could block each other or they will not manage to uh, assert their views and, and implement their views. So one national government will not be able to do that. So thank you very much. We now have the, the comments in writing and then two requests to speak, one request in this room and one in Zoom. So maybe we should um, be a little bit briefer. What I would like to know as well is that, I mean, many uh, who are present here are only listening and are forming their opinions, but I would also like to know of the organizations who are present here, um, would you participate in the public consultation process, um, but are only about to um, devise your own position? Well, Georg, first of all, you. Well, there was a request from Stefan ifenbach Troma to Bernd Hüttemann, but as uh, he requested to speak, I would like to give him the floor later on. One question from Tim Weffen to Sergei. And the question is in English and also quotes from the, the commission in English. So I'm going to read it out now in English. And there's one sentence. for the non-profit organizations and its scope, additional legal forms and national law, which based on identified harmonized criteria would be recognized in other member states. 
but in other member states jurisdictions by mutual recognition that's the quote of the question and then Verfen goes on to ask um, if you know what exactly this means and whether this means that the Commission considers a regulation based on Article 50 to create a, to create new national MPO legal forms or to modify the existing ones um, and whether the EU considers all member states to have a certain new type of association in national law. Well, we will collect questions first, but I'm not sure if I fully understood the question, but you hopefully did. Yes. Great. So then we will continue with Zoom and the request to speak. Unfortunately, I cannot read it at the moment. Please introduce yourself. Oh, maybe uh, it's me. My name is almost as long as the name of the organization. My name is Stefan tichenbach trommer from the Alliance Legal Certainty for Political Will Formation, and it's a political association, a German association of approximately 200 associations and foundations who want to have a political impact and uh, reach the boundaries of the German association law. And, and so far, I wanted to say uh, three to five things, basically. We of course, would like to make a contribution that we get these minimum standards. So we want to participate in the consultation process, but we are not quite clear yet what would be the most helpful contribution and what needs to be done within Germany so that the German government uh, is not again hampering the process. There is a time line, which is in parallel to a process in Germany. You brought up the coalition agreement of the current government, which wants to change the uh, German association law. And so the changes in Germany will be negotiated next year, as far as I can tell, and also debated in the German Bundestag, the German parliament, if there's no delay. So this means that we might see parallel processes um, and the message that we would like to convey within Germany is that it would be nice if Germany would be ahead of the wave and not just waiting. So first to wait for the EU and if the EU takes a decision and as a second step, we will um, lag behind, so to speak, three to uh, two to three years. And um, in the German debate, we have a huge issue of competencies in the political sphere. Um, the economics minister is not involved here. Uh, the finance ministry, I guess, is involved um, in terms of the factual competencies, but not really in terms of its, uh, I mean, there's not necessarily the expertise. And I think the finance ministry is not necessarily understanding the civil society, whereas I think there's a more relevant competency in other ministries, like the family ministry, also the interior ministry. And if the foreign ministry is not added to it, um, if they do not have to say something because of the uh, European level, um, it, it's great. Otherwise, it will be even more difficult to come to a unanimous position here. And the other question that I heard, um, I mean, those of you who are, in, those of us who are in favor of a European um, association, um, find some obstacles here. So if you want to make a political contribution, this is what we are being told regularly. You need to be organized in a democratic way. And and what about the um, system of foundations here in Germany? I think it's quite undemocratic. So one person decides that a lot of money is allocated for a long period of time and can also make use of tax credits, but still a foundation can do a lot of good. So we'll have to look at the values that are represented there. And do we need um, to look at the plurality within Germany as well? And do we have to make sure that there are more 
as a more plural setup within Germany. So thank you very much for the event. It's quite interesting. And I hope that the German parliamentarians will also uh, look into it. Thank you very much. Um, we have some participants from the Foreign Office that uh, are here today. Now, Frank from the BBE. Frank Hofmann, Diakonie, Germany. Oh, yeah, unfortunately, I couldn't see it correctly. So, um, this is one of the uh, nonprofit organizations, and the nonprofit organizations are, on the one hand, a uh, loudspeaker for people who are disadvantaged in terms of social policy, and on the other hand, the support that the welfare organizations provide to um, the people in the form of voluntary work. Um, we are uh, associations from organized in foundations and GGMBH. So this is why it's so important that we position ourselves here. And in coordination with everyone else, we wanted to participate in the consultation process um, with the um, EU. And we are in the course of forming an opinion here. So my question to you is, according to the German association law, we consider ourselves as an association which is or has an ideal mission, which is helping people who are in need. But we provide our services against a payment. So we are an economic undertaking, which is not um, working for its own ends. So how are we reflected in your proposals in terms of the non-profit aspects that are characterizing our complete internal setup, but also take into account our economic actions because we do not consider ourselves as an economic uh, association. Well, thank you very much. This brings up the question once again uh, that we've already heard from the Red Cross. So um, non-profit service providers. So how are they reflected in this proposal? Well, we have 10 minutes left. And now I would like to give the floor to all the speakers and um, for a short final statement. So what is your take home message from the debate? And uh, I would like to start with Ansgar Klein. Thank you so much for this very interesting debate. I'm going to start with the economy and civil society. In research, it's also a topic very often dealt with. There are uh, documents I'm going to send. We have in our Bundesnetzwerk, we have uh, quite a controversial debate about work. Um, and um, when there is an economy um, that is done in order to receive a salary or not. And during the climate uh, um, change, we've seen that there are a lot of difficulties uh, um, within also the very narrow cooperation. Um, and we need a, a co-productions, I'd like to call it, um, of uh, public goods. And we have a huge area where this is done for more than 100 years with a lot of positive and negative developments. And we can um, learn from this. And um, uh, the co-production, therefore, is very important. And I'd also like to announce that I'll send you some documents. I've been in contact with Jürgen Kocka, historian and a sociologist. And we um, we did a project, uh, Economy and Civil Society. Um, there is, um, there, it's, not, it's not only about uh, non-profit, about um, public benefit, public interest. It's about cooperatives and um, and decentralized networks um, of economic cycles, for example, and, and way more. And it's helping, and it's uh, very constructive and very fruitful. And um, in, in order uh, to have a cooperation between economy and civil society, we shouldn't forget about that. And we should um, answer that also to a European level. And um, we've I've noticed this today, too. 
we should deepen that and, uh, and with certainty that uh, this can also uh, about uh, the economy, but in a certain way. And, um, and we should uh, also uh, deal with this in a legal way. And this uh, I wanted to add, and then um, something more I'd like to add. Yesterday within our alliance, we talked about the uh, registers, and we are asking ourselves, is it possible to uh, um, uh, get rid of the bureaucracy? And um, and I'd also like to address this uh, here in the debate. Uh, we have to think about the registration and the registers, and maybe um, we should think ahead of a smart solution that could be usable on on um, at the European level and we maybe we could do this in one throw um, and um, in, not in order to avoid the situations of national states and their bureaucracy that's not necessary this is what I wanted to say I'm going to send you some more information and um, I'm looking very much forward to continue this debate thank you so much Bert Hüttemer from the EBD, and um, you've um, um, talked about the German Association statute because it's uh, democratically organized. And yes, uh, and it's part of this under understanding between uh, the peoples. And um, we work for that since 1949. And it's uh, it, it is possible, therefore. And another um, item. We are also in favor of entrepreneurs and other groups um, that are not democratically organized, that they also work for public benefit. And for and this is, we are talking about a bonus. Um, uh, so uh, those uh, uh, MPs, for example, that are in, in trouble with the executive power, they have to fight for uh, for more uh, democracy. For this, there is no bonus. So I don't understand why this is uh, pushed away. So for me, this is very important. And another um, um, very important point, we have to work on the um, pluralism aspect and approach. There is a competition of ideas and um, it's not about uh, white or black, and uh, I'm a little bit crossed with this uh, triangle of um, economy, um, society, and politics. Uh, we want to avoid what happened in Mecklenburg pre Pomerania. And Marta and Alexandrina, I'd like to give the floor to you. Marta, you'd like to start? Thank you very much. Um, I realize the, the time is short, so I, I, I won't be able to respond to all the details, but would certainly want to continue um, the conversation. And uh, uh, besides the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, I'm also involved in a pan-European civil society project called Recharging Advocacy for Rights in Europe which brings together human rights defenders from, from a variety of EU member states. And the reason we come together beyond sharing experience is exactly because there is so much to do to protect rule of law and civil society space. And um, the, the rare group has already uh, contributed to this discussion about how we could fortify civil society space in Europe with a with an advocacy paper. And we were also thinking about this issue with a lot of experts and many of the of of the discussion points here, I think, add to this. There is quite a lot um, that should be fleshed out in the in the consultation. Um, the input to the consultation from the Commission and what I can offer and and um, I'm sure others will also join in is to encourage as many civil society organizations from around the EU as possible to contribute to, to this consultation. So it's great to to see how relevant this is in Germany. Um, the issues could be particular to a member state, but the but the idea, I think, and the and the need is absolutely a, across the board and in in the European space. So it's also important for organizations working 
not only in in big cities or in um, Brussels to contribute to this and to feel that this also is beneficial for them because I think this is what can bring about the the sense of urgency that uh, Sergei you talked about the that we don't we don't have all the time in the world for this particularly looking at the upcoming EU presidencies later on so I think it is important to to really put a push behind this and to to get it right in in um, uh, perhaps maybe only a limited scope, um, but certainly to to have a strong message out there will certainly help the Commission feel that there is um, a need. So thank you again for for convening us on this uh, topic, and it was a pleasure to to be here, although in not in person. Thank you so much, Marta. Um, and uh, I think you've emphasized this very clearly that there are different national audiences and public spheres where we have to continue to debate that, but then we have to come together again. Thank you so much for your input. Thank you very much for your participation. Alexandrina, um, um, what is your conclusion this has been the second round that was um, very much marked by the German perspective, of course, but what do you like to add? Yeah, so um, an important takeaway, of course, is that we we always need to balance between pragmatism and, uh, you know, high, hope, high hopes, dissatisfaction with the proposal on the table. So I guess in civil society, we are quite used to do it, at least those that uh, interfere a lot with the European institutions. So I heard very well uh, from Sergei Lagodinsky that uh, we need to be strategic in these moments. And it's true that having a proposal on a table and a public consultation is already a huge step forward. And it clearly indicates that the commission wants to, to, to come up with an instrument that can respond to our needs. So clearly we need to create more spaces like this, uh, because I really think that we need to strategize in the sector uh, among us, both grassroots level, European level, to see uh, what kind of best response we can hope for right now, also in the current political context. So uh, I do hear all these concerns and um, I was intrigued by a question in the chat. We, we didn't get the chance to answer to it, uh, whether the European Commission would uh, have in mind to use uh, Article 50 and so to propose a, a legal form that would be to adapt nationally by every member states and in case uh, a regulation would fail, then simply the Commission would uh, propose a, a directive. But in case uh, there's no time to answer to this anymore, um, I take it as an interesting perspective to, to look at the proposal. Thank you so much for your participation too. Sergei, if you want, you will have time now to sum up. And, and from my, my point of view, the basis, the I, uh, fundamental idea is that there was a lot of interest. We have a high number of participants. Um, um, there is a lot of uh, optimism um, and the rule of law, um, the aspect of being cross-border. There are a lot of questions that still have to be answered. So there is a certain um, a tension between uh, what we want to do and what we are able uh, to do, there are restrictions, uh, will be probably compromises and um, pragmatism is required probably. So the question is what um, um, can we do about this in order to make this work and to have a good result? Thank you so much. And um, when it comes to the details, um, so the question about uh, made by Tim Wolfen, so um, I don't know if it's Article 50 or something else, but I understand and inter interpreted uh, this the sentence this way. So the Common Commission is thinking about this. I at least understand it this way, that to, to take these directives and um, through the directives, then um, to give the, a duty to the member states to uh, have an additional national 
uh, legal form uh, and to introduce this and this um, uh, legal form um, this would be uh, added to the cross border alleviations and and uh, mutual recognitions, mobility um, issues and matters are also an, a very important item. And we have experiences from actors from the civil society who um, want uh, who need to uh, move very quickly to another country. So there's potential for innovation and um, fa um, uh, creativity is required quiet and so to start there and and then to go national and to have a national legal instrument so this i i'd say um that is what i think is the commission uh, doing for three years this uh, is what i did use from my experiences in the last three weeks they cannot uh, find a hundred percent real uh, result sorry and um, so they'll move forward a step forward then and what you've said the question about the peculiarity uh, the uh, um, specific issues and and in the directive regarding the non-profits not um, um, of public uh, benefit so we're talking about non-profit so there's no exclusiveness um, so um, um, when it comes to renounce uh, profits but the uh, the key aspect the print um, the main aspect has to be the public interest and um, so I don't know if this is the uh, answer to your question, but, but in order to uh, have a general idea where we are currently standing, so these are ideas and proposals. They will probably serve as an inspiration to the Commission. They probably won't follow one to one these ideas. So these are what we want, what we think about that, our ideas, and this is what I think is a consultation about. And um, I wouldn't. Uh, try to fine tune every detail and um, stick to that. Um, it's about the important items. What do do we share? Or where can we unite behind? Strategically speaking, and I'd like to emphasize, we need an additional uh, legal form. This is what is um, one of the main aspects. This is also the weak point uh, within the Commission because it's a, a very difficult situation then for the Commission, and, and of course they maybe they want to try to avoid this difficult context and then move towards um, the way of less resistance to take just the um, directive and just address the minimum standards. So and then the pan-European idea is lost. So it would be important important to have this pan-European idea to emphasize this. And this doesn't mean, so it's not about my proposal that has to be followed uh, also with regard to public benefit. It's important to move forwards, to make a step forwards, to unite behind the uh, European concept of public benefit. I think we could um, uh, all agree that this would be helpful, but it's also something wh where tax issues um, are of interest, and so the Commission has to deal with that too. So th I don't see any problems with the German national uh, solution. I think that the European part, it sounds uh, weird, but but uh, you can also uh, uh, you can also it sounds weird but you can also uh, synchronize the uh, european uh, to the german uh, system and we've um, we've debated that um, in the coalition agree uh, agreement and this could be a more progressive line and also more pro um, and also progressive uh, compared to other um, european solutions so it could be a more fresh way and solution with a Commission, where we have this issue, this dilemma um, with the civil society, and uh, we could say so. We need uh, 
a, a common definition of public benefit, what is meant um, with public benefit, and we have to unite uh, and to agree. Um, and it, it's not only about tax uh, issues, and it doesn't have to move towards the tax direction. And then if there's a proposal made by the commission, then it goes to the par to the parliament, and then um, it's about us. And in parliament, we can um, have your feedback and work with your feedback, and then uh, how to synchronize and adjust it to the German solution and learn from um, from the German experience how to do it better. I don't see a, um, a competition, a controversy, um, and in, it's not, I, I think I'm not worried about uh, hindering anything. And in the chat, it has been written that some would like to take part in the consultation. And there was also um, some very um, um, concrete questions. So there are two documents, one for the um, uh, regulation, one for the directive, where to answer. Uh, of course, um, please answer both of them, uh, the more the merrier. And and I haven't thought about that, I have to say, um, maybe I should. And so there are two different aspects, and I, I, I work with both of them, And um, but uh, um, not forget uh, and, uh, and try not to forget about the feedback and, um, and to, to the sport solution. Um, they have to be independent, um, and I'm not against this. Um, okay, <laughs> one minute. Okay, I, I'm not against this, um, uh, to have this um, solution in order to take the conservative forces and the liberal forces on board, but a common agency would be um, um, helpful, and to have this added value of this uh, legal form at a European level, and and then with um, minimum standards at the highest level possible. Um, this from our perspective, and and it's uh, to have. Uh, it's also about having uh, minimum standards. I think these are the key issues. So um, freedom for uh, free citizens and for the free civil society and the right to take part. 